all right so now we shall play a next song which is based in from the state called manipur uh, in india where our friend uh, levan ji is from what is this mean this means that we've learned a new song this one right here and it's in seven different languages seven different dialects it's a song which speaks about living together and manipur a land so diverse so many cultures so many different languages so many different kinds of people but at the end of the day we are human beings and what are we supposed to do king mina si ek hoy right uh so moving on to our next song it is a song by one of the great masters of iran uh ustad hossein ali zade and his collaboration uh with one of the armenian masters jivan gasparyan who both happen to be legendary musicians and uh, we'd like to come to them next thank you Thank mm-hmm. you.
All right. After a glance at the beautiful culture of Iran, uh, we will be going next across the world to our uh, to a song called "Pedas Chicho de Esperanza," a piece of hope, uh, which is in Spanish. Our last two songs before we start the session. Uh, this song is a song that's against um, war, against violence, and in the current times where we are facing a lot of violence in the world, this song uh, finds a special meaning. So, and the next song is uh, a montage of Jagat's experience in Armenia during a time there. Thank you. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd ever dreamed before. I dreamed. Put an end to war. I dreamed 
Thank you. Uh, that was it from the music. Now the main session begins. Ah. So, uh, good, good evening, good afternoon, um, everybody, world, and uh, with the breathtaking um, music, uh, I would like to uh, say Jai Jagat to, to, on behalf of the panel. So I'm very happy, glad, and honored to um, facilitate, to be part of this panel on peace education in conflict areas, which is part of um, um, webinar series on building capacities for justice and peace. Uh, and it's part of Jai Jagat 2020, the move for justice and peace. Um, thank you all for organizing, for involving, and um, uh, I'm Shorena Lortkipanidze, I'm from Georgia, and um, I'm with my experience on peace, uh, uh, with uh, my injuries, uh, um, surviving and going through different conflicts uh, uh, from my childhood, early 90s, when the country um, gained independence, but it was not easy, and um, we had to break away regions uh, with um, occupied territories uh, and uh, with uh, compassion to the world, and uh, violence is happening uh, everywhere. And the recent ones, um, the protests in America and Europe uh, are connected to the brutal death of uh, uh, George Floyd. Uh, uh, yes. So today we're speaking how to counter this violence and uh, what is the essence uh, of uh, uh, and what are the different experiences, how to fight for a for, um, peaceful world. Um, so first of all, um, thank you very much to all our panelists. Uh, from all around the world, from UK, Sri Lanka, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Spain, Catalonia, um, India. We are so proud to have you with your experiences in this panel. And today uh, we, um, uh, we would like to, to speak about peace education essence of peace education. And we want to end this panel with some takeaways, uh, some um, new instruments, maybe new ideas uh, to, to advance them in our future work. Um, uh, and just very briefly, so what we are talking about, we are talking about uh, um, and uh, reflecting on different tools, methods, uh, um, how to do that, how to bring uh, uh, non-violence um, into the world. So um, today we will speak about this um, and we will have two hours. Uh, Leban Serta from India will uh, also be involved and uh, help to facilitate uh, this outstanding session with outstanding participants, practitioners, educators, uh, um, academicians uh, from all around the world and peace workers and uh, active experts. Um, so we will um, have very interactive session. We want, first of all, to ask our panelists very briefly to, to introduce themselves and the way they have uh, um, paved uh, and um, the experience they are bringing uh, into peace uh, speaking and discussing uh, on peace education. 
um, with this. Uh, um, after the first hour, uh, we will have again the musical break, um, break uh, and again we will be um, into this beautiful, beautiful, joyful, uh, very compassionate um, um, music, uh, which um, reminds us uh, what is peace and. Um, uh, and with this, um, I would like to um, give floor to Leban for uh, um, additional um, input for introduction, and then we will uh, go and we will give floor to our panelists. So, thank you very much, Leban. <coughs> thank you, Serena. Thank you. Good evening from India, and yes, good morning to people across the world, and good afternoon to all who are viewing us today. Uh, thank you very much. And I think indeed, today we see the entire world is reeling from two distinct events in our history, becoming a growing need to build capacities for nonviolence, peace and justice. At the same time, we also have the COVID pandemic, which is growing across the world and also violence, the death of George Floyd in the US. And all this, we see that this is the right time. Jai Jagat is a, a movement, a magnificent non-violence movement has brought us together and we are very happy. I like to say that we have, you know, we have to reflect on three A's. That is action, academic and alternatives. Alternatives will, incl in, will include both action and reflection and action again. So our peace education movement that we are going to talk today deals with what Betty Redden says, the conceptual core of violence, dealing with violence, how to control violence, reduce violence and eliminate violence. Today we have a panelist who are doing a lot of work, who have years and years, decades of experience and they will be sharing with us. And these are wonderful local narratives, which our global world can also take into consideration. I come from India, part of the Northeast India, which is bordering Burma. So this is a state which has a lot of ethnic groups. We have in Manipur around 34 ethnic groups, tribal groups, and the main co majority community. In the Northeast, we have about 244 tribes. Uh, you know, struggling to coexist together. In India, we have the parliamentary democratic system, which is, uh, we are experimenting in the Northeast. And also India, we have a very beautiful legacy of Gandhi, which was very active during the freedom struggle against the colon colonial British. But after India got independent, I think the nonviolence have taken a back step. But nevertheless, Today, India is still a very beautiful country with diverse culture, religion, and also I would say it's a land of a thousand movement. You know, and Jai Jagat is one of the beautiful nonviolent movement which has brought people across India together. Not only India, but across the world, who is again imbibing Gandhian values and sharing with us. And I think I will be also sharing more uh, towards the end, but I'm happy that uh, we are here together and we have wonderful panelists and we have, uh, uh, you know, they are working in the field. Uh, we can think of peace education at the global level, at the country level, at regional level and local level. And most of them will be speaking about what they are doing at the local level at the same time connecting with our global world. So we have a very rich experience we will be hearing from our panel from various countries. And I think Sharina will briefly uh, mention their names. And I think we will start the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leban. So we are really uh, very proud and honored to have um, this wonderful team um, uh, together. So today we will have um, we have Stuart Morton from United Kingdom and a very experienced and uh, um, person in peace education representing uh, 
uh, Quaker uh, Peace um, uh, and Social Witness, uh, and before that's uh, Peace and uh, Quaker Peace and Service, and uh, uh, member of Jai Jagat, uh, and with a lot of international experience. Uh, uh, we have um, Artur Domingo Barnils uh, from Spain, uh, um, um, academician. Uh, um, his uh, articles um, and, um, are on history, political history, um, education, different education topics. Uh, and he's from Catalonia. And of course, his experience, um, a person from Catalonia and peace educator is also kind of a, very interesting in this recent context to, to speak about and point. Uh, uh, we have um, um, from Iran, Majid Malikzadeh. Uh, he's um, running um, Ispahan Peace Museum and um, he's survivor of chemical warfare, uh, himself war veteran and now in charge of this uh, museum and of course the concept to share the concept of you know, this museum would be very interesting. Uh, I would like also to say that we have a uh, participant from Sri Lanka, Taiparan. Uh, Taya is, um, um, has wonderful, very interesting, contradictory experience and uh, he will share his uh, great real transformation from violence to non-violence and that, that could be also very emotional, amazing. And we have uh, um, uh, Santiago Gonzalez from Colombia uh, with his artistic and cultural background and uh, bringing these arts into peace education. And um, Yaneli um, Garcia from Mexico, um, also um, creative arts, participatory technique, uh, psychotherapy, and how to bring uh, these techniques into this education. So wonderful team, uh, wonderful people. And um, with the first, um, let's say, question and the first round of um, uh, contributions, I would like to invite uh, uh, Stuart uh, to speak about his uh, work, his experience, and uh, uh, some unique learnings uh, from uh, his practice to share with us. Thank you very much. And uh, please, uh, Stuart, you are the first. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's rather humbling to be part of this, uh, having known Ekta Parashad, particularly since 2002, when I first was invited on a Pajatra by Rajagopal. Um, this took me not only into the Gandhian tradition, but into part of the Quaker tradition because Quakers had formed a friendship with Gandhi during the Indian freedom struggle and had been of some assistance to him in negotiating with the British government. So the Quakers have been fortunate to have good friends. Um, my own experience is, is mainly being a connector into uh, issues in other parts of the world, mainly in South Asia, but also in Southern Africa. Um, my wife was part of a liberation movement in Namibia. And uh, those of you who are aware of liberation movements will know that they have pluses and minuses. Um, and uh, we suffered from the minuses of that movement. Um, I thought I'd just begin by saying that I've been, I've been taking part as, as, a, as a, a viewer really in a Zoom conference with Naomi Klein not so long ago, the American activist and thinker academic. And she was saying that um, we need to weave our collective visions. And uh, it seems to me that uh, Jai Jagat have really got a collective vision. And those of you who've got the time and the opportunity, I'd advise you to go and look at that little green and white book, which has been produced by Jai Jagat, because it really is a marvelous encapsulation in words. However, more importantly than the words, is of course the deeds that lie behind the words. Uh, and Ekta Parashad have really been quite remarkable in putting deeds uh, before words, though words are part of the deeds that they offer. So um, do have a look at that. Because I believe it could be a unification factor in the visions that we ourselves are trying to weave. Um, I've got sort of six points of learning, really. Um, this is more my own learning. 
um, may be of interest, may be of use, may not be. Um, I think, first of all, we, we can't do this on our own. We, we have to have companions in this vision. Um, this journey is ours. It's not just mine. And um, I think we need others partly to give ourselves a balanced vision that our reality is not somebody else's reality, but in one sense, we now live in a connected world and we've got to make this everybody's reality. Um, for me, the opportunity to be part of this has come through the Quaker movement. This, this was a, a 17th century faith-based, Christian-based movement uh, that felt that if there is God in every person, how can we possibly kill that person? We must look for that of God in the person. And that includes ourselves. And so um, it's on that journey that the Quakers go in relation to peace. Uh, we're not here to eliminate other people for our own apparent betterment. We're here to try and work with others, overcome our difficulties, and hopefully overcome the violence that is often part of us. Second point I'd like to say is that it's good for, to be part of the Quakers because they have a history. Um, and that history can sometimes give us a credibility which we may not in immediately deserve, but which can be helpful in offering friendship. Uh, some people have known of the Quakers through their past connections and they might invite us in, but we have to re-earn our trust. You know, you don't, your trust from history doesn't mean you've got it in the modern day. You have to re-earn that trust. And that's partly about working together with others. And um, we're also, by having a history, we also have a visibility, perhaps. We have a building, for example, in London. And in 2001, Raja Gopal came along to try and find the Quakers. He knew of them from the past. He'd worked with one in particular at one time when Andrew Clark, who recently died, was working for Oxfam. So Raja Gopal comes, came to friend's house and asked, would the Quakers come and join him on a Pajatra to learn about his work? Well, I mean, we get quite a lot of visitors in the center of London. So I asked Andrew, Andrew, um, do you know this man? He said, oh yes, I know this man. He said, um, I should hang on to him if you can. And it was that personal connection as well as the historical connection that enabled the friendship to be strengthened and some work together to be shaped. So that, that history and visibility is very important. Um, I think within this learning, the third point of learning for me is that we have to remain self-aware. In the case of a Westerner, we have sadly a dominant power. I'm male, I'm white skinned, I have money. Um, and these are things which can over influence others. Um, we have to realize the baggage we carry, particularly the more we look at our colonial legacy, which had some achievements, but also some crimes. And we're learning about one of those at the moment in relation to the slave trade and the murder of our black friend in America. So this is a sort of wake up call for us. Jai Jagat is part of that wake up call, and I hope that we can work. <coughs> I think perhaps the fourth learning point is that we believe every person has power. Um, everybody is important. Um, and if we're going to counteract the culture of violence, then I think we have to counteract it within ourselves, but also in every other person and with other people. Um, I think of particularly, you might think, well, how, how do we find the allies? And some work done by the Quakers in the former Yugoslavia recognized that even in the worst situations of war, there are people who are looking for a different way. And if we can find them and talk with them, we may not be able to do something at that moment, but we can together do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of planning, because it's not going to go on forever. And after that, one works together 
and a little book was written called To Trust the Spark, that each of us has a spark of light. Each of us has a little vision. Let's make it bigger together. I think in this as well, in the relation to the importance of the individual, I think the importance of kindness is also something that we must strongly recognize and affirm. Um, in the first workshop that I ran with Ekta Parishad in Dhaka in Bangladesh in 2003, we managed to get two Pakistanis to come. After a couple of days, one of the Pakistan's Pakistani friends came to me and said, I can't carry on. The air conditioning is affecting my lungs badly. I, I need you to switch it off. I said, well, I can't do that on my own. I'll have to go to the group. And we went to the group and the group said, of course, we must switch off the air conditioning. We'll just use the fan. And I think that sort of group kindness was also an affirmation of a continuing need to work together, to be friends, to learn from one another. Um, I think the fifth point perhaps is that we have got toolkits for nonviolence. The Quakers have got one called Turn in the Tide. It's been developed through and with others. The Bradford School of Peace Studies in the UK, responding to conflict program that developed wonderful cross-cultural tools. The tools are there for us. Let's try and use them. But one of the greatest tools, of course, is the work of Exaparishad. When you see them on the ground and you see the way they try and build leadership potential, you realize you are in a living experiment. This is a great gift to us all. And I was fortunate to see that. And many of you have been fortunate to take part in their marches. So yet, let's not glorify it to Parashad, but let's be thankful for them because they have done a lot of great work and are continuing to do so as we've just seen. Um, we did try together with Ekta Parishad to build an alliance of people across the South Asia region. And we can talk a little bit about that. It has some successes, some buildings, some affirmations, difficult to sustain, but perhaps this is the next step. So thank you for allowing me to take part. Um, the Quakers say, Peace is a process to engage in, not a goal to be reached. Let's not worry too much about the long-ended goals. Let's just work together with peace as a process. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It was wonderful overture of our, our webinar today. And thank you for your points because all of them are so wise. And I absolutely agree with you that uh, um, that it's impossible to do things alone. So we need the lies. We need the self awareness to know ourselves, to have allies and um, kindness and group kindness. And uh, I would uh, add uh, also something like respect and appreciation of somebody's work. It does not matter how big or small or it is. I mean, just appreciation and respect. So this is also a tool which we have people <laughs> to elaborate in ourselves. And with this, uh, I would like to give word to Arthur uh, and, uh, with your experience and uh, your, uh, your vision and your uh, unique learnings uh, you have collected during your uh, working and life uh, in, in the life. Yes, thank you, Shorena. Uh, uh, as Shorena said, I am Arthur Domingo from Catalonia, Spain. I'm a history teacher, nowadays retired, but I, I'm working since a long time, uh, long, long time ago, about the Gandhi's legacy. Sorry, my English is not very good, but I try to, to make me understand. Uh, I, I have been working uh, since a long time about Gandhi's legacy. I give some lectures about it and several, and several other topics like civil disobedience and, and non-violence in general. Uh, and also I write some articles in some magazines and newspapers about the, this, this topic, legacy of Gandhi, civil disobedience and, and other topics, similar topics. Uh, yes, uh, now I in part, not in all my life, but in part, I'm involved in a Catalan conflict 
uh, in Spain uh, in, in the fight uh, for the self-determination of Catalan people in the Spanish context is a, is a, is a, is a special uh, struggle. Uh, and I, I am working a little in this aspect, not like an, an activist, but uh, trying to, to make some reflections. Um, and it is the, the topic that I will develop, uh, I will talk in today, because when Jill invited me to participate in this session, she proposed me uh, exactly how do you communicate Gandhi and non-violence within the Catalonia crisis. This is the, what uh, Jill asked me to, to talk about. First of all, it might surprise many of you that in the heart of the democratic European Union and in a state homologated as a democracy, there is a political conflict uh, that has been going on for years and affect, affects a part of the Spanish state, uh, specifically Catalonia. Catalonia recognized it as a nationality or nation. Uh, and this conflict does a sequel, for example, of two non-violent social leaders, and all this sentenced to nine years in jail, each one, and total of more than 100 uh, years in prison for the set of 12 convicted social and political leaders. Nine of them, these people, uh, are nowadays in jail. Leaders who never promote the violence, or always they defend non-violent way. For example, Amnesty International, another international institution linked to uh, United Nations or European Union, call for complete freedom, at least for two of them, the activists, named Jordi, Jordi Sanchez and Jordi Cushart, uh, this is a political conflict. Uh, it's strange sometimes that in Spain, a democratic uh, state can, 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 can be this, this kind of problem. The cause of the, the conviction for these people is having promoted and organized a peaceful referendum on self-determination in October, uh, to th uh, first, October 1st, 2017, which the right-wing Spanish government declared illegal but they organized this referendum. But this referendum was in fact an act of non-violent civil disobedience, more an uh, authentic referendum with, uh, with, uh, with, with results. No? In order to uh, uh, non-violent civil disobedience, in order to achieve a negotiation that has been demanded from Catalonia, this kind of negotiation since 2010, uh, when a strong movement in favor of sovereignty and independence began. I can here explain all the history of the, these processes, uh, but uh, it's an interesting process. The Catalan conflict uh, has historical roots. Catalonia is an ancient country, but has uh, political policy roots also, a constant repression suffered for three centuries Sometimes this repression was harder, other less, until the arrival of democracy after the death of the dictator Franco. It seems to start a new period. The hardest, obviously, and most recent episode was the Franco dictatorship. And, but the conflict has a cultural roots also, like uh, Catalan people, ha we have an own language, Catalan language. It's, is my mother language, but I speak obviously Spanish without problem, but Catalan is our language. Uh, this language has been in many periods persecuted, also been banned in some periods, or bit like belittled. But this language has resisted because of its cultural potential and the esteem of many Catalan speak speakers for this language, for our language. All these along other elements forms a national consensus. Catalonia has a conscience of uh, be, be an, a national reality. In part, it's recognized in the Spanish constitution like a nationality. This is a long debate uh, some years ago. This, this situation has filled a feeling among a majority Catalan society that wants to be able to decide its future, accepting uh, principally two, di 
two possible options, two different options. One option could be the creation of an independent state, but independent state, but in the context of the European Union and with good relations with the Spanish state, because uh, we have uh, many uh, parents, friends, family uh, belonging from other parts of Spain. Eh? We, we want to do a good relations. But it could be the other solution uh, to continue within the Spanish state, but with a better recognition about its political or political personality and self-government and general conditions. For example, better political conditions, cultural conditions, economic conditions. In reality, people who want a solution that goes through a self-determination, this is the, 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 the key, referendum, are the majority. The majority of people in Catalonia perhaps is not in favor to independence, but it's in favor to self-determination. This is the key. This whole movement, mass movement, has been expressed almost, unanimous, uh, almost unanimously in a not violent way, way. I think it's important because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a strong movement, a massive movement in the heart of Europe uh, who uh, adopt the, uh, absolutely the non-violent way. But this non-violent, but in the practice, uh, for example, all the demonstrations of September 11 is the National Day of Catalonia, including a human chain that crossed the country from south to the north of the uh, or country in 2013. It's a, it's a long chain in favor to negotiation, in favor to self-determination. Other demonstrations in which between an, one and two million people have almost always participated. But Catalonia have a, po a population of seven and a half million. Then demonstrations from one, one million and a half or two million or one million, it's, I think it's, it's significant, it's important. But uh, non-violence in Catalonia has also uh, an ideological and philosophical aspect. All significant organizations have appealed no to the non-violent path is the only way many organizations. Non-violence has roots in Catalonia, in people like Chirinax, who uh, made some hunger streaks um, and, and fast uh, at the end of dictator of Franco, and the movement of uh, conscientious objectors and others. And many of us, um, writing, uh, uh, we are writing and, and speaking, uh, defending the Gandhian way, uh, or, Luther, the, or the example of Luther King or Mandela in his, uh, his last part of way, especially, as the way to go. Non-violence is, 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 is very uh, um, inner in the, in the concept of, of, the, of this movement. A great, I think a great test confirms is the, this non-violence, is the reaction of the people who participate in the referendum in the October 1st, on 2017, was exemplary without responding violently to harsh police repression. In this referendum, it was a, ve a very violent repression from the police and people react uh, peacefully. Uh, there are moving image which were seen around the world. I remember this year I, I went to India and many people in India uh, ha, had seen these images and the other parts of the world. Uh, this moment was the culmination of this movement with the referendum with large participation because, um, despite this referendum being banned which make it one of, in my opinion, one of the most massive acts of non-violent civil disobedience in Europe in the recent years. And two days later, the referendum, a massive response against the repression suffered on October 1st, in which many non-independent supporters took part against the repression. But the Spanish state didn't accept a negotiation until now to hold a legal and democratic referendum and good conditions. This is, this is our demand. 
and a declaration of independence. And then the declaration of independence was made by the Catalan government and the parliament because the, the asking for a negotiation uh, has not uh, answered for the government. But this uh, declaration of independence when, had not effect, had not effect due the threat of the state, the re more repression. And finally, this, this situation finished until now with the exile, exile and imprisonment of several leaders, as I say. Uh, in order to finish, I wanted uh, two minutes to uh, uh, explain what is the current situation and challenge, in my opinion. This movement uh, in, in favor of sovereignty uh, is now at an impasse. There is a pro-independence now, uh, pro-independence government in Catalonia, and there is a majority in favor of independence in parliament, but without the strength to resolve the situation. No, they have not in, uh, without the strength. Some ideas from my perspective and dangers. I have written several articles in this sense. First, it is necessary to define a strategy that gains more support in favor of self self-determination, not necessarily in favor of independence, but in favor of self-determination, uh, both in Catalonia, more support, but also in the rest of Spain, because in the rest of Spain, there are a lot of people who sympathize with the idea of negotiation and self-determination. I have many friends in the rest of Spain and also in Europe. Second, it's also necessary, it's important, this reflection, to avoid the frivolity and simplification of the conflict. This is a, is a very complex conflict. It's necessary to, to, be, to, to, to have a while, uh, to be conscient of that. And also uh, avoid the frivolity and simplification uh, about the strategies such as non-violent disobedience. Because sometimes people think that disobedience uh, is, is an easy way. And Gandhi, uh, talked to us uh, that it's a complex uh, way, the best way probably, but complex. Other, to avoid a drift of the movement, product of the frustration, this is a danger, uh, to avoid a drift of the movement towards chauvinistic or isolationist positions. It's important to avoid this way, who don't want to build bridges to dialogue. It's important to defend permanently the dialogue. Uh, that would be uh, lead to failure, but apart from being ethically and politically reprehensible. And even to avoid manifestations of violence, uh, still of low intensity, but uh, could tense the spirits unnecessarily. Uh, it's important to avoid. Until now, these manifestations of violence are, are absolutely minority and low, but uh, it's, a, it's a danger, always. Finally, it's necessary to contribute to a democratic, non-violent and satisfactory way out uh, or solution, and it should be our task. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for this uh, very interesting overview of the current situation and emphasizing the complexities of uh, the processes itself. And I absolutely agree with you that uh, there is no, uh, I mean, disobedience, this is not a simple strategy. This is, uh, it needs a while, uh, non-violent disobedience. And, and it needs a lot of self-awareness, a lot of knowledge, preparedness. Uh, so, and it's part of uh, this education itself. Uh, and thank you for your insight. We will have time to come back to these issues. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Majid uh, from Iran uh, to tell us about himself and the museum. And uh, yeah, also keep very <laughs> relatively short uh, and just uh, tell us the main things and uh, main learnings uh, during uh, the period you are running this museum. Thank you. And we're listening to you. Can you hear me? Here. Hello. And you have eight, seven, eight minutes for your presentation. Thank you, yes. please. For the first time. Hello. 
This is Majid Malikzadeh and my son from Iran. We are going to share a video, whatever we had experienced and had done about peace education for children and students. First of all, I want to appreciate Mr. Raja Kupal, Chief Manager of Jai Jagart, and all his colleagues, also Jai Jagart Iran representative, the Park Ethnic Culture Link Group, women and men's activists from handicrafts and sustainable development that introduced us and our museum to you. Hello, this is Masoud Malik Zadeh from the land of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, the land of handicrafts and natural beauties, the birthplace of the legend and patient people who are proud of recognition and acceptance, acceptance of diversities, different cultures, different races, and different dialects. From Azari to Ara from Azari and Arabic to Kurdish and Luri. The Iran is where Cyrus the Great was born, the creator of first global human rights charter in 538 BC. As you may have heard, my country is very beautiful about both the monument and nature. You should know that my, the roots of these beauties lay in the civilization of Iran, a civilization with a full age and power, which certainly kept its peace. Iranian have long been peacemakers, both in the words at poets like Sadi and Khayyam, and in action like Dr. Muhammad Mossadegh, the peace-loving man who, become, who can be considered as, as Iran Mahatma Gandhi. In, from, north to, from north to south and east to west, the creative artworks of the great Iranian artists are gazing the audience. In today's crowded world, there are men who are pointing out the peace and walking towards it. For, for example, some artists like my father, Majid Malik Sadeh, who bind art to peace for the sake of praising the name of Iran. I invite you, I invite you to come to Iran and also Peace Museum to visit this world-class museum and encourage us with your presence. Dear audience, I would like to present my deepest salutation and my compassion's greeting to you. I wish permanent peace, security, and relief for all the human societies. Allah says, we created you from one father and one mother. This means that our very first responsibility is to love each other and equality. And we made you as, as tribes and groups to recognize each other. So in color, and race and nationality. No one can find any sign of superiority over the others. And not that the most respected persons among you in front of God are those who are more successful in acquiring knowledge, serving the societies and identifying the creator of the world, the God of wisdom and knowledge. I'm pleased that Sadi, one of the most well-known Iranian poets, of 700 years ago has a poem that has presented the same message in poetic and literary form to the world. Human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Introducing of the history of the museum. This museum has a long time history 
57 years, my father's activities and 27 years, my activities. This museum contains many art workings with metal like copper, brass, and other metals. Why did we name here Peace Museum? There are two reasons. One, we changed hard metals into soft and meaningful working, art working, based on love, nature, literature, and peace. And second reason, it's about 13 years that I have focused on peace activities, at least in Middle East, and designed and gathered many signs, stories, and poems, and also souls of different lands related to peace between nations. Our point of view about education are one, a strong effective role of teachers and artists in education. Two, patients in cultural works. Three, there is nothing useless in the world. Four, KSA and peace. Five, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and peace. Six, coil of peace. And finally, seven, action plan and details for peace. I think this is enough for now. Thank you very much. It, it was amazing, uh, and uh, I have a feeling that I'm there in this museum and this, uh, like, not only metaphor to transform hard things into soft. So, I mean, uh, you're doing it, and also it's a great metaphor, I think, and it's very much uh, linked to nonviolence and um, transformation. So, thank you very much. and. Um, I think that uh, the next speaker uh, is um, Taya from Sri Lanka. And what we want to propose is after Taya's um, speech, we will have break, music break, and then we will continue with our uh, other panelists. Please, Taya, floor is yours. Please unmute your, yourself. Unmute. Kaya. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, nice opportunity to meet very experienced people from different places of the world. And, uh, um, and especially thanks for Jill and uh, Ikta Prashat and Jay Jagat for inviting me for this discussion, especially. So thank you, Jill and Raji Bhopal. And also really, I'm so happy to meet Stuart after a long time. And so that was also really a great uh, opportunity for me. Um, talking from my experiences, uh, I, I have two kind of things. One is the work that I do through my organization uh, in terms of peace education and all that. So other one is, Modeling me as an example for nonviolent, being a violent, uh, violent person into nonviolent. There are two kind of uh, things uh, I would like to share. I'm not sure about the time frame about that, but anyway, I, I will try to keep it within that time. So the work, first of all, I would like to talk about the work that we are doing right now in Sri Lanka. The work, me, the work that we do here is mostly on peace building, conflict transformation and uh, promoting nonviolent and uh, at the end it's kind of a social change for the whole society for us because of this uh, nearly a 30 years war war ended in 2009 
has given a whole lot of impact in our work, in our life, and um, on everyone in Sri Lanka. Uh, apart from, from where we are coming from, which ethnic community we are, which religion we are, and uh, which district we are living in. Apart from those things, it has given a whole lot of impact on everyone in Sri Lanka. I'm, I'm, I'm from a minority community. Uh, so because of the war in Sri Lanka, there was a lot of discrimination, a lot of injustice, a lot of violences, uh, especially against the minority communities, but at the same time, against the majority community as well. So we were, we were living in a kind of a conflict thing, situation uh, throughout our whole life. And uh, when we started our work in Sri Lanka, uh, actually Quakers helped us to start the work. Um, and uh, I was one of the person really actually started this organization with the support of Quakers. Um, and when we start the, started the work in Sri Lanka, what we were thinking about how are we going to continue the work in Sri Lanka in a kind of a violent situations and all that. Um, especially we were talking about peace and uh, peace as a learning process and uh, how to build a peace related uh, environment within, within the society and uh, how we can learn about nonviolence and how we can practice uh, nonviolence in the violent situation. It was a really challenge, challenging uh, effort for us to continue our work in Sri Lanka. Because due to this uh, kind of a conflicting situation uh, within and between communities, that created a kind of a kind of a, uh, environment where there are a whole lot of negative judgment about each other's, neg mostly negative judgment about each, each other's, and uh, misperception about other people, really, you know, this community like this, that community like this, you know, that kind of a, uh, that kind of a problem was there. As a result of these judgment and the misperception, and stereotypes and jealous and all sort of things that create a whole lot of gaps between and among communities. So our really our task was how to bring those communities together. Even to talk about peace and even to talk about peace building, even, even to talk about reconciliation, even to talk about nonviolent action, we need to bring the community together. Our mostly our focus on how to bring people together. That's where really our peace education came to practice. So our peace education was focusing on how to give awareness to people to look at themselves and uh, to understand the whole concept of violence and the impact of the violence. Because, because of the war and the impact and the victory, given a kind of a bad example, to the community that is sometimes violence work well. We can get everything by using violence. That was a bad example was given to Sri Lanka because of the victory of the war. Now we have no war, but no peace. So we are really not sure about where we are standing and all that. Uh, we are clear that there is no war, but still we are living in the same kind of situation while we were uh, during the war, uh, war period. So that is how really we see uh, the situation. So our work on nonviolent and our work on peace education is mostly focusing, as I said earlier, for focusing on how to educate people on transformation, how to educate people on reconciliation not educating people, actually giving an example, how that would be looked like if we can transform ourselves. Uh, that was really our main focus. And, uh, and, uh, and, and also we were focusing on mostly on self-transformation uh, because 
if you if you take the Sri Lankan local context, even each and every family from Muslim community and Tamil community and singular community, there are three main communities living in Sri Lanka. But at least one person will be there in the armed forces. At least one person will have been in the past with the liberation movement. So mostly everyone, every family, very close relation, related to this violent action in any, any way, really, you know. So in this context only, we have to, uh, we have to work with the community. Uh, the work my organization uh, is doing right now is working with community directly, working with, working with religious leaders directly, working with uh, political leaders directly, also working with the government sector to give them a kind of an awareness and education. What's the meaning for life? After all, whatever we do in our small period of life, what we can achieve. So by in getting involved in the violence, will what will give? So giving that kind of awareness and kind of insight about the impact of the violence, uh, we believe that really that is one way to give a kind of a to to how can you say that to bring people into a non-violent side anyway from violent to non-violent. So, some extent we have succeeded in that way work. Uh, we are working with all three communities together. We are working with everyone very closely, and uh, we promote non-violent uh, through our work and we create opportunity to bring people together. We uh, personally work with everyone and giving psychosocial support to everyone. And, uh, and we have published some books as well anyway, uh, on peace building and peace education and all that. Um, but we have challenges. Um, after this, the new government now is ruling uh, the country is not supporting these nonviolent actions. They mostly believe they can rule the country by using power and forces. Uh, now, everywhere you can see armed forces are with power. Um, even, especially against Muslim community, they their approach and, and the way they work with Muslim community is not acceptable. It is injustice and uh, it is really, really very bad at the moment anyway. They, they work with Tamil community in the same way. And now they have, after the war, in two, uh, when the war was ended in 2009, the Tamil's uh, liberation movement's action was were stopped and destroyed. After that, now they dealing with the Muslim community. So this is how really our work is ongoing and we are continuing the work still now, still really we are continuing the work. And uh, that's how really we hope that that's only the way really we don't have any option other than doing this work. Even though there, were, there are challenges, we have no option other than continuing this nonviolent work. That is how my organization still functioning, working with all three communities in Sri Lanka. I always put myself into the community as a model, how I can uh, be an example to others to, for the self-transformation. As I said earlier, really, I'm from the minority community. After the independent in 1948, uh, the community which I am belonging, was not given a space to take part in the whole life. Uh, we were uh, controlled by forces and we were controlled by constitution. We were controlled by all, all uh, government mechanism, uh, not given equal opportunities, not given equality and equity like other majority community. As a result of that, 
there, there were a lot of liberation movement started. In my 18, when I was 18 year old, I could not see any other way other than joining in the liberation movement. Then I joined the liberation movement in, in, at the age of 18 and, uh, and uh, trained as a person to fight for uh, self-determination and freedom and for justice and all that. That's what I was believing at the beginning. I know that really, that's, that was really a danger, da dangerous part. I didn't know that at the, at the beginning that was a dangerous part, but, but I know that really this is only the way we can do. That's how really I joined in the liberation movement and, uh, and became a kind of a political leader in that moment one at a time. Um, and I have led many actions during the period. Um, and I have taken many lives of, of the people as well. And we really, I need to recognize that really, you know, I, I have the, I, I'm taking the responsibility, but even though I was doing because of that, my duty and all that, but still when I think about that now, really, I feel really guilt and uh, I'm taking the responsibility for that, for those actions. And when I was working politically, uh, that I realized that, Really, that's not the way to get a freedom, or, or get a uh, to get a uh, uh, self uh, determination to my community. Really, uh, I, I start to re realize that really violence will not be the way to do that. Really, then uh, it was really hard for me to uh, take a step back from that position. But I encouraged myself to cut off myself from that violent moment anyway. So that was a hard decision because I was enjoying very high power by the time. So, but that's a hard decision for me. But anyway, I took the decision and really, I, I dismissed myself from that moment. But I had to pay a lot for that, uh, for that action which I took physically, mentally. Uh, so, I, I paid a lot for that. And uh, I had to leave my own places and uh, really I had to hide myself for some time somewhere in Sri Lanka. One side I was chased by the government, other side I was really chased by my, my, my movement as well. And anyway, really, you know, that was a hard decision the hard time. Not only me, my, my whole family was involved in, the, in, the, in the, the violent movement, even my wife also part of this woman wing by the time. Um, actually, when I hit, when I met, when I, when I met Quakers, really they helped me to heal myself. So by the time uh, William Knox and Jenny uh, Knox they were the Quaker representative in Sri Lanka. Uh, fortunately, I met them uh, during that time, and uh, uh, then then I started to talk to them, and they helped me to heal myself. And uh, they said that really, it's not your fault because you have done because of you, because of, uh, based on your faith. So it's like a, it's like a uh, violence committed by a religious organization. When you, when you believe something, really, you do that. Really. So you have done that based on your faith. But you, you, you are believing something else now. Really, you, you can easily, you can transform yourself from that, to the, that side into this side. So that's how really I get involved with, uh, with Quakers and was given opportunities to learn about myself and, uh, and come out from the whole pain. But I, can, I was able to handle the pain, but still I could not come out from the pain anyway. So still I'm having that. Um, and, uh, you know, 
and my, me and my wife started to live together and we have one children one 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 son my wife also started to involve with the women rights uh, uh, work and uh, uh, and working with working for women and all that because of her work and uh, the work there were a lot of threaten from the militant side because he was working for the rights of the women and again abuses the uh, against the women, women abuses and uh, rape and all that so as a threat the she has faced a lot of threats and as a result of that we had to send our son in his 15s to other countries because we could not keep him because we were we had a fear that feel something will happen to him as well anyway. So, but even he could not come even for her funeral as well anyway, when she died, she could not come. Now he's here with his family. She's living in France and has come to come here Sri Lanka to meet me, to see me. Sometime I go there. So. Taya, it's very emotional. I mean, you have touched us with your story. I mean, this is uh, one of the, how, this is how you can teach uh, nonviolence, how you are sharing your story with us. I mean, I think that that's, that's great. And uh, maybe we can stop now to have a break, to have a music, meditation, and then we can continue and uh, go back to our discussions. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, there, there are te tears on my eyes as well when I'm listening to you and your story. And this is exciting. This is part of education. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And let's have a short five minutes break. Um, I'm asking um, Jai Jagat's technical team to, uh, floor is yours and um, please grant us with, with beautiful music. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, since we are running a little uh, over our scheduled time, uh, yes. we'll keep it a very short uh, break. I'll just play one of the songs that was, uh, it's a song from Assam for Peace. Uh, it was uh, a song uh, that was sung during the Yatra by uh, an Assamese peace activist who had joined this, uh, named Tara. So please enjoy the song. Thank you. Jolly bod, hurry, say, be so. Laggy, a second. Hobaru, the god, you hear. Ami, hunty, hey, Ami, hunty, hey, Jolly bod, hurry, say, be so. Laggy, a second. Ami <laughs> Hoda <laughs> Lagia sekena, ho baru se koru hewa, 
आमी हांति हेरा अन्यायर प्रतिकार प्रेमे रे करी मन्यायर प्रतिकार प्रेमे रे करी म परार्थ रहे तू आमी जानिलु मरी म जानिलु मरी म जली बधरी से विश्व लागिया से के जय जगत जय जगत Thank you. Uh, can we continue? Leban? Yes. Leban, maybe. Yes. Unmute, please. Unmute your mic. Yeah. Hello. Welcome back to all of you. I hope you can hear me. Tayab, that was a wonderful yeah, testimony. Yes, that was a wonderful testimony. And in the first session, we have heard four speakers who were sharing their field experiences. It's such a rich narrative that you have. And we are very glad that we can learn from most of your stories. But now we have another 45 minutes. So we will structure the time in such a way that we have two speakers. Uh, we have uh, Yana Lee and Santiago. Each of them will take eight, eight minutes. And then after that, maybe Sharina can also share about her experience in Georgia. And then we can take some questions and we will ask the observers and participants to address the panelists and maybe we have a good number about 50 participants i can see them it's wonderful and i think now we will listen from yanali yanali is from spain and mexico and we she is a teacher of creative arts and she does a lot of psychological i think trauma counseling and Tell us about yourself and what you do and some of your experiences and that would be wonderful. Over to Yanali, please. Thank you, Levan. Um, thanks for inviting us to participate to this forum. We're very pleased to, to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Yanali Garcia and I'm part of the team of Otra Escuela. Uh, I'm a psychologist and facilitator with a training in creative arts and participatory techniques. And um, I'm being, I've collaborated in different NGOs, projects in Mexico, Guatemala, England, and Spain. I'm original from Mexico, but I'm living in Spain right now. So I'm going to tell you a bit about Otra Escuela. What is it? Where are we? Um, what we do? So Otra Escuela, which in English will be other school um, because we try to do things in a different way. Um, it's an NGO that has been working for 20 years. Actually, we just um, had our anniversary this past May, 20 years, <laughs> it's a lot. And um, we work in the construction of peace, uh, of cultures of peace in Colombia and other Latin American countries. And since, since 2017 in Spain, by using game-based learning and artistic languages. So the main thing about our work is like, we sharing tools for creative 
a creative and positive transformation of conflicts. So our work is based in gender equality, human rights, brain and pedagogy, and popular education. So you might heard about uh, Paulo Freire, which is one of our main authors. We've been inspired by him uh, in all our work. And one of the main uh, books that we use a lot is The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So you can find it on PDF online and it's in English and Spanish and Portuguese. It's wonderful. So we use like all these methodologies because we uh, we take that as a, a we, we share this as a tool uh, for personal and political transformation. So all of this work that we've been doing for 20 years, we've been shared, it's been shared by, with teachers, social leaders, and young people in, like in Colombia and in Spain as well. So as you might know, like, uh, Colombia, it's been like an armed conflict country for, it's living this armed conflict for several years. So we are working there in accompanying anti-militarist and peace building activists, movements and organizations. So in this framework, uh, we, of the implementation of the agreements up to the end of the armed conflict, between the guerrilla of the FARC, you might have heard about this, and the government of Colombia. Well, we are permanently working from the base, I mean, from the communitarian like work and the collectiveness, right? Well, with young people, indigenous women, Afro-Pacific men, and um, peasants from the south of Colombia, the Cauca, which is like a very strategic, extra, um, it's very, it's a main region where the oral armed conflict is, it took place. So since 2017, we like a part of the team came and moved to Spain. Uh, and we wanted to promote the scenarios of dialogue and creative multiplication uh, from the experiences taken back at Colombia and in Latin America. So with this, it's, it's, it's something that we, we really like to share. It's like we try, we seek to reverse that like hegemonic uh, relationship that governs the international cooperation, you know, like this logic of like only the North countries can go to the global South and bring the, um, the knowledge sort of thing. So we want to, we want to transform this like logic sort of and create like those spaces of dialogue as well and bring the best practices that we had in Latin America that can fit somehow or can enrich the practices here in Europe. So uh, from that, we have like three main lines of intervention. The first one is to provide specialized training to agents of change so they can replicate this methodology that I will explain um, a bit more later. And um, so they can replicate into their communities. The second one is systematizing the experiences, the best practices that we have in, in the base communities. And we invite the people to participate in this, like registration of experiences. So it's very, it's very rich, like the, the results. And we also use participatory techniques in order to do that. And the third line of intervention well, is like cultural activities and management of cultural activities. So the people includes itself as well. So the community. So as you can see, we tend, we try to um, embrace like, um, the hor like horizontal, like mm, more like a um, way to, to, to be. And um, so these three methods as they're like, they're the result, like especially of our own professional development. I mean, through the years we've been like taking like new pedagogies in or out, just like shaping 
um, the the methodology to whatever is like our own experiences, right? So for this, um, in the core of everything, we have culture and pedagogy of peace. So if you can imagine like um, a scheme or something like there's like a circle in the main thing in the main center and from there are the three branches that comes out from that. So the first one is empathy. We do believe empathy as one of you said before, I don't remember if it was Stuart or yeah, like empathy and kindness, right? So we use like this new, it's kind of like new concept. Um, it calls neuro coexistence. But in Spanish, it's neuro convivencia. Mm -hmm. And we love to play with words because we also believe uh, by playing with words, we play with imaginary and we also can bring new scenarios of peace, uh, building peace. So this concept, neuro coexistence, it's like relatively new and we have been applying to our practice. And it means like we center the implementation of various and holistic techniques to better improve the way we teach and how that information is absorbed. I mean, so we need to take into account like if we have like a group of people that is like under stress, they're not going to absorb the knowledge or the participatory techniques or anything. So first of all, we need to like create an atmosphere for the people to be to trust in the environment. And sometimes that might take more than we want or more than the than yeah, like I mean the process is important, right? So take a process in the center. So the second, <clears throat> second one is creativity. So we use different artistic languages. Why? Because for some people, some people can be like super good at talking. Like they can be like super great poet, like um, speakers. But some people it's better at movement, like movement, like to like body awareness, or some people might be good at the plastic, um, you know, like painting and stuff. So by taking a bit of all of this, people might shine in one of this because they will like feel connected with that. And that means you can put, uh, you can express through arts without even saying it sometimes because so like mm, sometimes social trauma, we can uh, like put it words because it's it's difficult to elaborate. So that's why we 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 think it's really important to take different artistic languages. And we don't have to be we don't have to be art you know like the art uh, art super technician in arts and stuff because we all creative right. And the third of all, like it's nonviolence, and we have like a theory of peace, education, and nonviolence. And we also, um, in our programs, we have like a, a scheme to work on this. And sometimes we do like the performance, performance, or depending on the group and stuff, in order to find um, uh, nonviolence uh, activities. So um, to to end, I, I like to say like we we are very focused on a methodology that it's called socio-affective. Why socio-affective? Because it integrates the affections, it integrates the emotions. So generally in the culture, like in, in Colombian culture, in Mexican culture, in European culture, we divide, you know, like like the reason, like the mind and the body. And we, we are trying to get that together as a whole as well. Um, so, so we use the collective and the horizontal learning so we can transform violence cultures into cultures of peace and understanding cultures of peace as rooted in empowerment as a source of empathy 
nonviolence and consciousness, like critical and creative disobedience as well as one of you, Arthur, say actually. So, um, hello. Yeah. 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 Nale, I think we have to take a break there, and you can okay. come back. <laughs> We're going to have a quick round again. So. Okay, I got so okay. excited. I'm sorry. It's yeah, so it's wonderful. It's nice to hear the stories, Thank you. especially the peace pedagogy and what you're doing in the field. In fact, um, we were trained by Bernard Lafayette in the Gideon Values, and he has worked extensively in Colombia. And we have a lot of friends who are working there. And also we have the Peace Counts, which have one soccer for peace that is around, I think, Cali or Medellin, Corona 13, like that. So we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. So I will invite uh, Santiago to share more. And both of you are working together. So he can, he can also, again, share his work with us. So Santiago, you can take yeah. your time. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. OK. OK. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. OK. OK. And we'll take uh, another quick round after that. Okay, so quickly I will try to uh, take the word of what we were explaining about uh, the work that we do in Otra Escuela. And we were saying that we use socio-affective uh, methodology that has four uh, steps. The first one is to do an experience, to make an experience, to have an experience with the, um, with the group. The second one is to have a reflection among these experience. And that can be a reflection that can be a personal or a collective reflection. After that, we have a theorization about um, the experience and the reflection. And after that, we have a contextualization and the, the contextualization is where uh, the critic knowledge began. So in that way, um, let me see a moment. Yeah, a moment, please. Chuki, chuki, chuki. Yeah. So um, we were saying that uh, with this way of, uh, yeah, building uh, knowledge, we want to change violence cultures uh, that starts from relationship based on fear and control and homogeneiz homogenization. In that way, uh, we have learned and we understand the change that we do in with this methodology, with this, with this peace building education, are have three cores. The first one is social ties, where we began to understand and value the diversity, to break the stereotypes, and to affirm the value of love, to have constructive relationships. The second one is the emotional, where we have awareness emotions, and we have to express the emotions, and we have self-care and care of others. And the last core is the agency, where we speak about responsibility of acts to have the responsibility, the decision of taking a look and to taking alone or with others and uh, the straightening of organization. With this uh, like changing course, we understand that we, we began to have some change uh, and to build some peace, peace education. In that way, I will say first of one, one thing that uh, we find very interesting and is that the peace is like a living concept. Uh, Stuart talked about like we are living experiment experiments, but we talk that the peace is a living um, concept that changes among the context. And that will be the challenges that we have understood uh, with the, the work that we do here in Colombia. The challenges are first of one, uh, the, the, the construction of the enemy image. We found that is very, very important uh, and a core work to have cultural change and not only legal and normativity change that 
it was something that happened here with all the peace agreements. So the deconstruction of enemy image is something that is very, very important. Also, we see that the relevance of pay attention to the context instead of bringing ideas without having a background, because the context gives us valuable information and that has a relationship among the concept of territory. We, we speak about peace building education and territory education also. And other thing uh, that will be very important to, to say is that we have to understand the diversity as a unity. Uh, some experience that we have had uh, here in the 90s was that with the neoliberalism uh, yeah, reforms, we have a fragmentation of social movements. And what we were saying about the Cauca, that is the region where we work here in Colombia, is that we have fragmentation of the social movement. So we have uh, indigenous people by one way, uh, Afro-Colombian people from other way, and peasant people from all, from, yeah, like working in alone. So that is some, some challenges that we see. And for finish, uh, something that we are understanding with the opportunities that, that came from the pandemic and the global crisis from the COVID-19 is that we are, first of one, is that we are experimenting some changing paradigms. Uh, that was, I want to say that we are understanding the systematic, a systematic perspective of life, like a holistic way of life, and uh, that have a relationship with that uh, definition uh, as a piece, as a living concept, then changes uh, with the context and the people. Other thing that we see as an opportunity is to show how the education is an integral whole. Uh, we have to integrate the family, the community, the state, uh, the private enterprises also. And uh, to finish, uh, something that we see that has a very power is the co-vulnerability co uh, that we are experimenting in, in a global way. So we understand that the co-vulnerability is uh, a way to understand the humanity and to understand the creativity also. So finally, in Otra Escuela, we understand that the crisis has both uh, as danger and opportunity. For this reason, here and now, from the confinement, that we are in confinement here in Colombia, we believe that the crisis caused by the global health emergency is an op opportunity to relate to fear and precarization from the standpoint of care and solidarity. We believe that these are times when, once again, the need of empathy and interdependence require, require us to resist authoritarian logics and militarization of lives as a form of security. That will be some points for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you very much. Yes. That was very interesting, and especially your involvement at the field. When you involve with you know young people and we hear we hear and read so much about the gangs and you know about Colombia and the peace talk that is ongoing. And I believe your organization is uh, doing a great job. And as you as you share with us even beyond this you know event we can learn a lot and i think jerry jay jagat will continue to link us up and we can learn from each other now we have a we have a question for majid and his son masood one of the question is how did he involve his son into this wonderful project museum for peace i had an experience to visit uh, Richu Maikin University in Kyoto, Japan, which is called a Peace Museum. But today, in one glance, Majid, I can see the rich culture of Iran, 
um, also the one of the, the observer has asked this question. So can you tell us how you have involved your son into this active peace movement, especially peace education? And after <clears throat> that, I will ask Sharina to facilitate the, the round, the second round for, with the panelists. Over to Majid, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Great yes. to see you again. Yes. Involving me and my son has a deep roots and history. I invite you to come Iran, Isfahan, and visit from near my museum. 22 years ago, I've, I've heard a sentence from a novelist that told us until the time that the business buying and selling locks and chain, the issue for the humanities, no one can expect for a prospect of real peace and security in the world. This sentence of novelist encouraged me to do something, not especially art. For what? I decided and tried to serve art in meaning of peace. This is not enough for me, just art. This is not enough. This art cannot satisfy me. This sentence and other stories encourage me to do something for humanities and serve this museum with 86 years old, just for sale of peace. I want uh, Masoud to tell you a story about patient and peace, one of our topics. By Nikos Kazantiks from Serba the Greek. I remember one morning when I discovered the cocoon in the back of the tree, just as a butterfly was making a hole in its case and preparing to come out. I waited a while, but it was too long appearing and I was impatient. I bent over it and breathed on it to warm it. I warmed it as quickly as I could and miracle began to happen before my eyes faster than life. The case is open. The butterfly was started slowly crawling. And I shall never forget my horror when I saw how its wings were full back and crumpled. Wretched, the butterfly tried with its whole trembling body to unfold them. Bending over it, I tried to help with my breath. In vain, I needed to be hatched out patiently and the unfoldings of the beings should be a gradual process in the sun. Now it was too late. My breath had first, the butterfly tried to appear all crumpled before its time. It struggled desperately and a few seconds later died in, in the palm of my hand. That little body is, I do believe, the greatest weight I have on my conscience. For I realize today that it is immortal, seen to violet, and a great loss of nature. We should not hurry, we should not be impatient, but we should confidently obey the internal reason. Thank you. Dear audience, these stories shake us, shake me. And I decided to do something. Not like before. This museum set as a dynamic place, not a static place. We prepared a place for negotiation about peace. This is satisfy me. Maybe some people do anything, but not, not satisfies them. But this work and art working in serve of peace satisfy me. I, by my heart, believe this action. As Mr. Taya said that, sometimes I lost myself. We lost myself in this way. 
And this is a proud for us, a proud, proud for my son, a proud for my family, my wife, my daughter, my mother, all of us in serve of peace. Thank you very I much. Have, you're welcome. Thank you. I have Thank another uh, part. Uh, if you let me know, or let me uh, time. I have uh, to tell you another part of my education uh, plan. This is uh, by you. Yes. Thank you, Majid. Uh, absolutely exciting. And uh, uh, Masood, I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> excited with your how wise you are and uh, how internalized is the, all these uh, uh, learnings and um, uh, the, everything by you. That's great. I mean, and this is how to involve children and how to raise children with these values. This is absolutely I'm great what you're sharing. Uh, so we are getting to the end. Um, so and um, um, I have a lot of emotions and um, a lot of uh, um, thoughts for myself uh, uh, from discussion and from the stories uh, we've heard. Um, so and uh, with this last round, very brief, where we will ask to all of you, including ourselves, uh, <laughs> Ban and myself, uh, just very briefly. What, uh, yes, you already mentioned in your presentations, especially Taya, you mentioned about, and Arthur also, that this power struggle, politics, uh, um, th this is the great challenge for peace education and the peace in the world. And actually, um, peace is something very enriching and people bringing peace and peace activists. And it's very difficult to to make peace and to do things non-violently. It's not easy, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of things um, to be prepared for that. But what do you think? Uh, and you also mentioned about this common vision, about the strategy, and uh, Arthur, you, in your case, you mentioned about these four um, um, points, uh, about the strategy, in case, and this, um, this concrete case, but this is important. What do you think, what is the main challenge in this world uh, for um, this uh, to be achieved? The, what, what makes um, these walls um, in front of us? Uh, and what is um, the main thing we can do? I mean, we, we already touched upon these issues, but uh, what could be this disruption? I mean, this um, breaking out what, what do you think, uh, how it can happen? Because in, in history, we know certain events when in some, some, some people, some personalities or some events uh, uh, brought some peace and they were like uh, kind of breaking through. So what is this main challenge today and what could be to your mind, uh, the main breakthrough to change the world, to make this transformation happen? But on the other hand, we understand that this is the process we are talking about. <coughs> Maybe Stuart, you were listening for so long because you were the first. Maybe you can reflect very briefly on these two points. Thank you very much. Um, I feel a little bit um, inadequate because we've heard so much. Um, I'm conscious at the present moment that uh, there are uh, a number of crises appearing. Um, in this country, we're very aware of the Black Lives Matter movement, but we're also very aware of the ongoing challenges of the climate crisis, the climate justice. Um, and I think that we can learn from crises. I think has already been said by some of our speakers, uh, this can be an opportunity. It is a danger, but it can be an opportunity. However, the question that sort of comes in the back of my mind is, uh, is there time? Well, uh, we don't know if there's time, uh, but we have to keep hoping and meeting and trying. Um, and I suppose that's where I'm at.
maybe not much more to say. So we can learn from crisis. This is Thank great learning. <laughs> yes, thank you. Arthur, please, your turn. <laughs> Unmute, please, your mic. Yes, I think the, the world after the COVID is, is really uh, uncertainly and it's an incognite. We it's 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 too it's too soon to to understand how the the world it will change. No, but I think there are some questions that we can think. No, for example, politically, where will democracies, but not only the democracies and the poly, all the political systems evolve because this is a this is a threat for humanity uh, we evolve to more democracy or we evolve uh, to more authoritarianism uh, the control the technology also can be um, some some way to the control other problem it will be very important the economic crisis and the neoliberal capitalist system uh, where, where, where will they lead? To the populism, to the neo-fascism? Uh, uh, there, there, there are a, a big, a big questions. No? Obviously, as Stuart told, the climate emergency or the climate change, uh, uh, if we, we are not uh, aware about this question, it, it would be very terrible. And to what extent will human values and human needs not just material values and needs, but also uh, come to the fore. How to do without thinking uh, naively to put the human needs uh, to the fore? Uh, I think that there are uh, many, uh, many questions uh, in, the, in the table. No? Mm -hmm. Then I think at the same time, the, the COVID crisis put some lessons uh, before us. For example, the, the importance of simple and everything, healthy eating, eating mm -hmm. familial friendship, relations, hugs, walls, nature. It's mm -hmm. a change in the mentality of many people uh, at this moment. The, this is a, an opportunity. Uh, uh, at the same time, the precariousness of human life. I think people are, uh, we are more conscious that they need to be according with the nature also the importance of healthy environment, uh, the importance of care, health, educational, educational uh, to the elderly people, the importance of solidarity, the ineffectiveness and, of an economic system, neoliberal capitalism, but at the same time, time the, the absence at, until now of visible alternatives today yeah. the, that are reality because the neo-capitalism, uh, the neoliberalism is very terrible solution, but for example, the Chinese system is not perhaps very <laughs> for us, no? But uh, we, we, uh, um, that, uh, we will have to build them. This, we will have to construct this new uh, alternative. Uh, I think they are a very, very big uh, Thank question. You. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, Yene uh, Lin, can you can you share your like very briefly challenge and uh... yeah um, well I think um, I'll say we need to we need to articulate more we need to strengthen the networks we need to recognize our allies like right here right now I can see like friendly faces for example that we can do more together and like we need to take into account like the crisis doesn't hit the same way like different territories or bodies or because there's all this intersectionality that we need to put in the center and be self-criticism like as facilitators as um, agents of change right so we need to take that into account and there's uh, like a phrase that I've heard the other day with uh, some Mexican colleagues that like, let's not let them or the system let us colonize our imaginaries. So we need to free our imaginaries in, in order to, to imagine new scenarios. And this is all new. Um, it's like, uh, like tons of possibilities, but as well, um, 
there's like different forces that play different uh, power roles that we need to take that into the into account. And also, what is our own like attitude in to face conflicts? So, are we like responding to this competitive way in, in a comp like by being competitive as well? So, hey, we need to pay attention to that as well. So, mm -hmm. I think self criticism is like super important here, and also um to to network you know like being like in the network so that'll be mine thank you thank you very much santiago maybe you can also say a few words i would say um that for me like to understand the the care uh like something that became from the love and the love from the co-vulnerability uh, for me, we are in a change. We are a, a changing paradigm, and uh, with like in context, for example, the climate change, we are seeing that. So for me, it's like to connect about the care uh, as the love with the love and the collective in a collective and political engagement. The instant of the competition and the individualization that are like the core of the capitalist system and the fragmentation of the neo that the neoliberalism uh, make in us that will be thank you thank you very much uh taya maybe last few words unmute please unmute your mic taya please i'm sorry yeah yeah, the, the, the real challenge for our work is uh, actually um, the breaking the cycle of violence in all sectors. Because when you look at around us, even the political structure is based on violence, social structure, religious structure, even personal beliefs, economical structure, even the cultural structure. Uh -huh. Everything is based on violence, actually. So how to break this cycle of violence is a real challenge uh, at the moment. Uh, then what we are trying to do is, in order to do that, really, we need to show some model to the community or to the world or to the, to the people, in which really we need to create a nonviolent community which maintain equality, equity, trust and understanding, and loving each other, understanding each other's feelings and needs. So creating such a community and showing to other people is, we feel, I feel, that's only the way to yeah. demonstrate how this violence can be handled and how the changes can happen and all that really. It is how to take the responsibility for our own violence and how to, how to put ourselves into the transformation process. So through some actions and all that. So this is how I see really you know, this, uh, this nonviolent and peace need to be brought up uh, into many levels of the community. Yeah. Majid, last yes. words maybe from you, last few words, challenges and breaking through, I mean, how to. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. As uh, all panelists said that democracy, economy, climate, and I said, growing up terrorism is the main and vital challenges that humanity encountered with them. I strongly believe that coin of peace has two sides, children and teens, and other side, youths and adults, women and men. For decreasing the consequence of these vital and uh, many harsh activities which surrounded us, we have to focus on children, families, education by strong teachers. Just only this way can save us from future. Mm -hmm. In that case, every focus on just one side 
will be useless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leban, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Yeah, what, what I would like to emphasize again is that <clears throat> we build movements and curriculums based on <clears throat> building political efficacy among younger generations to dialogue in a nonviolent way. And I think that is our continuous exercise. Strat has mentioned, you know, it's a process, but in our teaching and learning system or in the teaching and activism, I believe that we must continuously emphasize imbibe nonviolence. And I think this is where Jay Jagat can actively continue to work and link us all. And I think this is an exercise that we need to continue. After hearing all these stories, I'm also overwhelmed. And also this has been a challenge for me, how to you know, introduce peace education in the system, addressing structural violence, systemic violence, political violence, racial. And I think this will be a, a challenge even now and post COVID. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. And um, just to add to this is that, uh, I mean, this uh, courage of um, um, somehow uh, not destroying, but just uh, to counter uh, existing narratives. Uh, this is very important. So because um, we struggle, we struggle a lot, even in Georgia. So there was no opportunity to to speak, uh, but it's uh, it's difficult. We for peace uh, people who are like uh, peace activists, and we understand the Gandhi way, and it's very difficult because it's uh, it's still uh, margin marginalized somehow. It's still we we need a lot of courage to uh, to counter these existing narratives, and uh, it's very very important. So this is the transformation is in that as well. So I absolutely agree that this care you, you brought some Santiago self uh, pre criticism, self reflection, self aware, um, uh, and Taya, your great inputs uh, starting from communities, working from communities, involving uh, children, and um, um, and uh, the kindness you mentioned, uh, Stuart. So I think these are all methods, values, principles, instruments, all together, which uh, really is very, very important in, uh, in this long process of uh, um, transforming the um, world into um, peace and nonviolence. Um, and thank you very much to all of you for being part of this panel. It was interesting, emotional, uh, enriching, uh, and I'm very happy to have you as friends uh, and as uh, part of this uh, core thinkers and allies as we, you mentioned uh, in the beginning. And um, thank you to all our uh, listeners, people um, watching on Facebook. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, Jai Jagat team for arranging and technically supporting. And thank you Monica for all your, your support and Jill and the others. Okay, thank you and uh, goodbye and see you soon. And I hope that we will continue. And this is, uh, it was great opportunity to know each other. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, God. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. You can speak. Jai Jagat. Jai Jagat. Jai Jagat. Do we have, uh, do we have music? Uh, uh, in the end? Yes, we have a yes. musical interlude. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Viva Jai Jagat. Viva Peace. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Let's conclude with a small musical uh, video for peace. So this will be the final song we play today. This is a song for togetherness. I hope you enjoy it. Jai Jagat. Thank you.